Welcome, everyone, to this briefing brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF, and Hebrew name is Abit Chonistim. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong national security to defend Israel. It's a great pleasure to be joined today by Brigadier General Amir Avivi, the founder and chairman of IDSF. And we are in a little bit of a different location than usual. We are at the United Bakers Dairy Restaurant in Toronto, Canada. We've come to Toronto to meet so many wonderful people who stand so strongly with Israel. It's great to be here. It's great to do a live briefing from Toronto. If you're watching this from another city, another country, and you want us to do a live briefing in your area, reach out to us and we'll make it happen. General, thank you so much for joining. My pleasure, Moshe. Why don't we begin and let us know what is happening right now in this war? So at the moment, Israel is fighting this multi-front war. Um, many attacks, both in Gaza and in Lebanon. Uh, today, we had a very sad incident. A rocket was shot uh, in the north. It hit uh, five uh, workers uh, that were uh, working in the fields. Uh, four of them were from Thailand, uh, foreign workers, and uh, an Israeli. Uh, so what we see in Lebanon is that Hezbollah's capabilities are being degraded systematically. Uh, Minister of Defense talked about the fact that maybe they have 20% uh, rockets left. Uh, IDF is hitting all the time, continuing to hit leadership, tactical leadership, strategic leadership, uh, storages, and so on. Um, and most of the shooting we see in the last week or two is focused along the border. It means that Hezbollah is shooting with short-range uh, rockets that they have left. They had many of those. Uh, we didn't destroy all of them. Um, but it doesn't seem they have really much strategic capabilities. How do we know? We saw we attacked uh, really firstly Iran. Hezbollah was not able to do anything, was not able to retaliate anywhere, anywhere, anyway, seriously. To an Israeli attack on Iran, the whole idea of Hamas and Hezbollah, the whole build-up Iran did, was to defend themselves. This is the strategic depths they created in order to be able to defend themselves from an Israeli attack. And now they're stripped out of these capabilities. Hamas and Hezbollah cannot pose any strategic uh, threat on Israel. Yes, Hezbollah can still shoot rockets here and there statistically. They cannot aim uh, at anything. Uh, just shooting sporadically. Uh, we are using uh, our air defense. Uh, in the last week, um, the Ministry of Defense signed a huge deal uh, that will bring in a few months uh, to the IDF the laser uh, capabilities. And this will enhance dramatically Israel's capabilities to defend itself against uh, rockets, against uh, missiles especially the kind that are shooting uh, at the moment uh, in the north. Uh, in the north, the IDF is uh, an, in a very advanced uh, stage of dismantling all the infrastructure Hezbollah built for 20 years on our borders. Um, the more, more than 2,000 Hezbollah terrorists were killed. Um, huge amounts of weapons and capabilities were seized uh, by the IDF. Um, whole villages that are all one big military terror post uh, were taken out. Uh, there were villages on the other side that maybe in the whole village, one house was not connected to terror infrastructure from a whole village. So any village where a house was connected to terror infrastructure or had uh, weapons inside it was destroyed. So whole villages were wiped out um, along the border. And Israel is creating the terms to bring back the citizens safely. Um, we're not still there. We need to continue degrading uh, Hezbollah's capabilities. And as uh, Israel is uh, attacking in different places in Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah sites, the pressure in Lebanon is amounting to more than a million people displaced. Um, anywhere Hezbollah build uh, its capabilities, uh, the IDF is calling the people to move out of the area in order to be able to destroy these capabilities without collateral damage. So we saw in the last two days the 
Arab spokesman uh, of the IDF calling uh, the citizens of Baalbek. Baalbek is, is in North Lebanon to move out of Baalbek. We're talking about 100,000 people that were moved out of Baalbek uh, in order for the IDF to be able to attack all the Hezbollah positions inside Baalbek in a way that won't endanger uh, the people. Um, but you can imagine what it feels like when 100,000 people in one day are displaced and uh, this amounting pressure we're hoping will bring the Lebanese uh, society to realize how devastating it is to have Hezbollah in Iran and what they're doing to their own country and how they're using all these civilian sites uh, undermining their own citizens. And we need to degrade Hezbollah to such an extent that will enable the Lebanese to really rise and take back their country. They have an historical opportunity, and we have an historical opportunity. And, I, and in the last months, unfortunately, you know, the fighting against Hezbollah, because this is a, was just the beginning of an offensive operation, We unfortunately, we had a, quite a few casualties. A soldiers were killed and injured, um, and citizens... And uh, unfortunately, in this uh, situation, you have voices saying, ah, this is uh, terrible, people are getting killed, we need to stop, we need to do a ceasefire. And we hear also these voices uh, in, the, uh, in the world, you know, also in the U.S. with the upcoming elections. But I think that the strategic understanding that needs to, Israel needs to have, and I think it, it has it, is that we can win decisively on all fronts. We can dismantle Hamas. We're in the position to really create a reality where also Hezbollah will be dismantled according to Resolution 1559 um, and really change reality for generations and not just do a ceasefire, let Hezbollah survive it, and then in five or ten years we'll, we'll have to go to a war again. This doesn't make sense. We need to eradicate them. Uh, and, and for this, we need also the international community and also the population of Gaza and, and Lebanon to do their part and take responsibility for their lives. And this is a process. We're not, cannot, we cannot fully control this process. Uh, we can degrade and destroy uh, these uh, organizations. Uh, but at a certain moment, we'll have to see also uh, counterparts uh, in Lebanon and citizens in Gaza saying, okay, we're taking responsibility of our own lives and uh, also assisting in uh, dismantling this uh, these organizations. Um, I think that after the attack in Iran, the reality now is that Iran has been stripped of the two most powerful forces it had, Hamas and Hezbollah. Israel took out all Iranian air defense. There were two kinds of air defense in Iran. One, air defense specifically uh, defending uh, nuclear sites or strategic sites. Israel took out this uh, air defense, but there was also air defense geographical, overall covering uh, Iranian uh, airspace, and Israel took that also. So Iran now is completely exposed. Israel has full freedom of operation. Israel is not afraid that if they'll attack Iran, uh, Hezbollah or Hamas will shoot, because they cannot endanger us seriously. Um, and this is a very defining moment, which creates two realities. One, Iran being so exposed, uh, we understand that they will probably try to accelerate the nuclear program in order to defend their uh, regime. And this is dramatic because the, the regime number one uh, interest is to exist. And if they don't have the strategic depths and they cannot defend their airspace, they really are left with one thing, mo moving forward fast with the nuclear plans. And Israel, on the other hand, and also it needs to be an understanding globally, understands that this is going to happen and, and, and we have only two choices. It's either they become nuclear, which would be devastating, or we take care of that before. So this is a one-way ticket. It's either way. And therefore we cannot stop. We have to take out the nuclear sites of Iran. Now, this is not going to happen in a day or two. 
it's a process. And because it is a process, uh, it will go beyond the elections in the US and also the beginning of the next administration. And therefore, it's really crucial to see what will be the next administration's policies. And also, in a way, on the 6th of November, or 7th of November, after the elections in the US, what will be the legacy President Biden will want to, to leave in his presidency, regardless of who wins the elections? There will be two months where President Biden will have to decide what his legacy is going to be. Is it going to be a legacy of appeasement? Or an opportunity to really seize the moment and attack militarily Iran and really make a huge, huge change and even not only securing the Middle East and dismantling the Shia axis, but also bringing peace agreements. So it can happen in the coming two months, and maybe it will happen later on in the next administration. But if the next, next administration will be an administration that continues with the policy of appeasement, de-escalation, ceasefires, and not decisive win, Israel will have to continue doing what he's doing to defend the people of Israel. We need to be able to defend ourselves by ourselves. And if we need to do it alone, we'll do it alone. We'll do it alone and we'll deal with this uh, threat. We won't allow Iran to become nuclear and then endanger us existentially. So really, I think one of the important things we're doing an IDSF as we have done throughout all this year is continue to empower the society, the Jews around the world, continue to empower the government to seek total victory. And total victory can be achieved. We can eradicate Hamas, we can dismantle Hezbollah, we can also destroy Iran's uh, nuclear sites and military sites in a way that this Shia axis will not pose a threat anymore. Uh, to Israel and create the terms for peace agreements, for prosperity, uh, for a completely different uh, future for Israel and the region. Thank you, General, for starting us off that way, giving that beautiful overview of the state of the war right now. Let's jump into some questions if we can. So we know that on the northern front with Lebanon, um, many of the residents up on the northern border of Israel, their primary concern was a repeat of an October 7th style attack where Hezbollah would breach the border of Israel into, into northern Israeli communities. So currently, the, the extent to which Hezbollah has been degraded, is that still a concern? Is the concern really rocket fire or is there still a real life concern that the Radwan forces could actually enter into Israel? Well, I think that's... The fact that we really dismantled all capabilities of Hezbollah near the border and the fact that the IDF is on the other side of the border. Um, I don't think that Hezbollah today has capabilities to storm um, the towns as it did before. It's mostly now about maybe anti-tank missiles uh, or uh, rockets. Um, but when you hear the leadership of uh, the different cities and towns in the north, they don't want another, uh, they call it uh, Operation Protective Edge, the way we did it in 2014, where we went in, destroyed all the tunnels uh, along the border with Gaza, and then went out. And then years later, 7th of October, they said, no, we, we want to make sure that if we come back home, there won't be in the future any threat like that. And they're, they're looking, obviously, at the long term, not what will happen just now. And in the long term, the way to deal with it, to make sure that they won't be in danger, is dismantling Hezbollah. It's not enough to talk about Resolution 1701. Not enough to talk about uh, not having Hezbollah in South Lebanon. It's about not, not having Hezbollah at all. And this is what we need to push, and this is what we need to insist on. And certainly when Israel is anyway going to deal with Iran also and the whole axis, why stop? We need to do what we need to do. And 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 really the, the challenge is to really uh, convey this to the society, looking not in the short term, understanding how meaningful the win will be in the very, very long term. And for this, 
we should continue fighting. Now, today, you know, I interviewed in the radio uh, in Israel. I was explaining same things. And, and, and the guy interviewing me is saying, but, but you know, we're fighting in the South and Lebanon for a year. And, and what do you mean? Why do we have to continue? And I said, no, it's not true. I mean, we have been on the offensive in Gaza for 11 months and on the defense in the North. We have been operating offensively in the North only a month. Look what we achieved in a month. So a month is a very short time to carry out offensive uh, in an area like Lebanon. So yes, we need maybe two, three months more to to completely destroy Hezbollah, whatever is needed to destroy them. And we, we have to continue attacking until we achieve uh, the point where Hezbollah will be dismantled and not after a month say, okay, let's uh, stop and let Hezbollah build itself uh, again. The same goes for Iran. So it's worthwhile continuing to fight because the price in the long term will be huge, huge. And th therefore it's worthwhile continuing the fight and not running to do ceasefires uh, or trying to find uh, solutions. Also, I think if I was Netanyahu, um, I wouldn't do any deal before I know what's the outcome of the elections in the U.S. and who will be the next president and what we can get of that and what, what might be the next policies. Anyway, we have these two months we have to continue destroying Hezbollah and Hamas and possibly also attacking in uh, in Iran. Um, so we don't need to rush this. We, we need to wait and, and see that when, when we really want to get a deal, that it will be the best terms Israel can uh, achieve. As we know, in the early stages of this campaign against Hezbollah, Israel very impressively took out the top echelons of Hezbollah leadership. So when people even consider a ceasefire or sitting at the table with Hezbollah, does Hezbollah have a command structure, a, a leadership even capable of making those types of decisions? Is there anyone for Israel to even talk to? Uh, so um, Hezbollah or Iran appointed a new uh, leader uh, of Hezbollah, a guy that has never commanded and has no military experience. And um, the Minister of Defense already announced that his term is going to be very short. And he better start looking for somebody to replace him. Um, well, this is all managed by Iran. Iran is, is even directing directly commanders on in South Lebanon. It's not really working through the leadership of Hezbollah because Hezbollah's leadership was destroyed. So Iranian uh, military advisors are trying to work directly with tactical units uh, in Lebanon to direct them uh, because the, this uh, command and control of Hezbollah is pretty much broken. And uh, we need to continue really degrading them. Uh, Israel is also uh, at, attacked the banks, uh, really depriving Hezbollah from the capability to pay salaries. Uh, Israel has closed the Syrian border, not enabling Hezbollah to smuggle more weapons into Lebanon. This week, we also attacked um, um, gas uh, installations and oil in order to for them not even to have the fuel needed to, for their cars. Uh, so Israel is systematically destroying all their assets, uh, and we have a long way to go. We have many, many targets to to shoot. Uh, and if there is no dismantling of Hezbollah, Israel should all the time maintain full freedom of operation, as we did in Syria for years, in order to continue degrading them systematically. We cannot have any reality where Hezbollah can rebuild itself again. So it's either they are dismantling Hezbollah and we have a new era, even a peace agreement between uh, Israel and Lebanon, or it's an open campaign 
where every time they will try to appoint a new leader or build up a new force, they will be destroyed. And then Lebanon will find itself, like Syria, constantly being attacked all the time, as we did in Syria now for years. And this is why, by the way, the Syrians are not managing to pose any serious threat. And, and in Lebanon, where we let them build themselves for 20 years, we, we see the level of build-up they did. In Gaza right now, Hamas as a governmental, as a military entity has basically been destroyed, but you still have these Hamas fighters with the ideology of Hamas that look like they're not going to give up to the bitter end. Would the same be true in Lebanon with Hezbollah, that once Hezbollah as a military, so to speak, is, is eliminated, there's just going to be months and months and months of removing these Hezbollah terrorists? Do they have the same fighting spirit? as Hamas? So, as I said before, both in Gaza and in Lebanon, what will happen will be dependent on the society. Uh, in Lebanon, it, it's easier in a way because uh, most of the Lebanese society is not Shia. It's not uh, part of uh, Hezbollah. There are Christians, Maroonis, Druze, Sunnis. So the chances of seeing them really seizing the moment and uh, not enabling Hezbollah to rebuild again uh, are pretty high. Um, in Gaza, I think one of the reasons that Hamas uh, still is able to function is the aid. The fact that all the humanitarian aid that we're bringing in goes into the hands of Hamas, this is devastating. The only way to really change this reality is create the terms that this aid will go to the citizens and Hamas won't be able to seize it. IDF is working on solutions. The government has demanded the IDF to find solutions for that. It's not happening yet the way it's supposed to be. Uh, but when we will figure this out, I, I think this will be the moment we'll see Hamas really not controlling the society anymore and losing uh, ground. As I mentioned in the beginning of the briefing, we're coming to you all live from Toronto. And since being here, the general and I have met many people who have shared their personal and communal experiences with anti-Semitism and the rise of anti-Semitism. And I see many people in the chat writing in about anti-Semitism uh, abroad. So, General, my question would be, to what extent is the increase of anti-Semitism that's happening across the world, is it a real strategy and piece of this puzzle of Iran, or is it just a coincidence? No, I don't think it's a coincidence. And uh, both Iranians and the Palestinian Authority are heavily, heavily invested in promoting anti-Semitism. I mean, BDS, one of these leading organizations operating in universities, is managed by the Palestinian Authority and by Palestinian groups. Anybody who goes into BDS site and scrolls all the way down and sees who is managing BDS, it says BNC. PNC is the group of Palestinian organizations led by the um, Palestinian Authority. Palestinian Authority is a strategic threat to Israel. Hamas was an operational, tactical threat, but the Palestinian Authority is much more dangerous. They are a real strategic uh, threat because they promote delegitimation in Hag, in the UN. They promote anti-Semitism. They endanger the whole Jewish world. Um, and it's time to expose them. And it's time to bring down also the Palestinian Authority. Uh, the only chance we have for any coexistence uh, with Arabs in Israel is without all these terror organizations, really based on local leadership of uh, the local clans in the different cities and not based on terror organizations that are devoted to a complete uh, destruction. And in this sense, Hamas and Palestinian Authority are the same. They promote exactly the same ideology. Thank you, General. I want to ask one final question. You speak a lot about this total victory, just completely destroying Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, so that Israel can have this golden age. But at the same time, we know that Iran plays the long game, and there are no rush to end the conflict. So on the one hand, we in Israel uh, are looking forward to that day after and you speak a lot about what Israel will experience. But on the other hand, our enemies are planning on dragging this out forever. So how do we get to that point of the day after? How does the Israeli society and world Jewry and those who love Israel kind of wait for that uh, moment of victory 
uh, when potentially it can be a very, very long time? Yes, it might take a few more months. It might take a year. Um, in Hebrew, we say, Am anetzach lo mefached midech aruka. The people of eternity are not afraid from a long journey. Um, and I think that time is playing in our, in our favor, not in their favor. Every day that passes, Israel is getting stronger and, and more resolute. And what we're managing to do is amazing. Every day that passes, they get weaker. Um, so we, we need patience. We need patience because to achieve a total victory on a scale that is biblical uh, takes time. And we are living in a biblical moment. We have to really understand. Let's see the big picture. See the big picture that we are going to ensure the security of prosperity of Israel and the Jewish people for generations. And to do that, you need to fight. You need to fight and win decisively. Um, and I think this is the most important thing I encourage all of you um, to really be engaged in, in empowering our soldiers, in empowering our government, in empowering our communities uh, to really understand this historical moment. Uh, and I'm very, very optimistic about the coming year. I think we'll see great things um, and they really will move towards uh, this total victory, but this is providing we don't are not at, attempted to get a you know a ceasefire without really this total victory that can be achieved, and it can be achieved. It's not just a word. We can really do it. We can dismantle Hamas. We can dismantle Hezbollah, and we can really uh, make sure that Iran won't pose a threat to Israel. Uh, anymore it's achievable and i hope with a bit of luck that we will be able also to get uh, america to join uh, in yom kippur i spent uh, you know most of my time in the synagogue but between the prayers i i read uh, again uh, one of the books of churchill and looking at the ways he tried to get america to, to fight alongside uh, Europe against the Nazis. And we have to remember that even when the Nazis conquered all of Europe and France, and even when Churchill wrote a letter to Roosevelt saying, we are making a last stand here in Britain, maybe in a few months we won't exist. Even this didn't make the US motivated enough to go to war. It takes time to get the U.S. to to really do the right thing. Um, and I think that uh, basically Israel is really, really creating the terms, all the terms needed to empower also the U.S. to decide to lead an attack on Iran and completely change the fate of the whole globe, the region, and also of the people of Israel. So we have to pray that this will happen. Brigadier General Amir Avivi, thank you so much for joining me for this briefing. Thank you to United Bakers Dairy Restaurant here in Toronto, Canada. Thank you to our live studio audience watching this briefing. It's great to be with all of you. We will be back with you for more briefings. We're traveling right now, as you can see, and therefore our schedule has been a little bit different. We're also having some challenges getting at our emails uh, internationally, so apologies on the lack of communications. But we will be back with you 10 a.m. Eastern Time 5 p.m. in Israel or 4 p.m. No, 5 p.m. in Israel next week. Until then, stay safe, stay strong. Take care, everyone.